So good morning everyone and uh, thanks for joining our sixth educational webinar. My name is Maximiliano Bianchi and um, I am the communication manager of uh, this project that is uh, XF Actors Project, a research project uh, to improve prevention, early detection and control of Xylella fastidiosa through the establishment of a multidisciplinary research program. It is a four-year project founded by the European Union within the Horizon 2020 program. Um, the webinar will be moderated by Zivren uh, Voss. Uh, I will introduce him uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and, um, and the topics and the uh, um, and will be conducted by Elena Lazaro, and uh, Zivren will uh, introduce her later. The, this webinar will last about um, 50 minutes, and for, uh, 45, uh, 50 minutes, and then there will be a slot for answering your questions. Um, by the way, you can write your questions, your comment, using the chat, in the right corner of your window. The webinar uh, will be recorded and we, it will be uploaded on our website and on, uh, and on our YouTube channel in the next days. Um, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance of this webinar, uh, please write an email to our official account at the end of the webinar. Um, I'll write the, the email in the in the in the chat right now so now i i give the floor to zibren before i just i will just want to introduce him is uh, uh zibren Vos is uh, an agricultural engineer by training specialized in rural engineering and water management since 2008 he's working as a plant health scientist in the european food safety authority where he has been involved in the coordination of pest risk assessment activities, pest categorization, and in the development of a methodological framework for such activities. More recently, he is coordinating the European Food Safety Authority Pest Survey mandate that provides a toolkit for surveillance of plant pests to assist the European MSCs in the planning and in implementation of their service. In particular, he is chairing the EFSA working group of pest service that prepared Xylella fastidiosa pest survey card and also the guidelines for statistically sound and risk-based surveys of Xylella fastidiosa in the European Union. Zibren, uh, when you want. Thank you. Uh, so uh, can you maybe put the presentation on the screen? Yes, of course. OK, so uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, thanks a lot for attending so many to this uh, uh, webinar. I would like to give a particular thanks to the XF Actors Project for uh, hosting us in this uh, webinar and for giving us also the opportunity to present this, uh, this uh, uh, work that we are doing. And it shows really a cooperation across Europe of this type of uh, interests and the uh, developments that we have to do on uh, common goal to control Xylella fastidiosa. So um, I am Sibon Voss, as I was introduced. I'm a scientific officer in, in the European Food Safety Authority. I will be your webinar moderator and um, I am working in EFSA in the uh, plant health unit that is part of the uh, plant health team that's part of the alpha unit and uh, uh, so I, we are here today to talk about this webinar. So this webinar uh, about the Xylella fastidiosa uh, survey guidelines. So this webinar was organized mainly uh, following the publication, the recent published publication of our guidelines. Uh, these guidelines, they were prepared 
in, in, in an EFSA working group of experts of different uh, types of expertise that were represented there. And uh, also it was uh, uh, taking into account and capturing the contributions of the member states during uh, five workshops that were held in the course of 2019. So the, um, the guidelines uh, are developed to support basically the implementation of statistically sound and risk-based surveys. Um, it is also uh, developed to exp uh, in this webinar mainly to explain what we you will be able to find in the guidelines. We don't want to reproduce the guidelines. We don't have time in this in this short duration of presentations. So uh, in this 40 minutes or 45 minutes of presentation that uh, uh, will be provided after, uh, it will be mainly focusing on, on some illustrations and explaining what you will be able to find in the guidelines. Uh, basically, it will show you the flexibility of the approach that has been developed and the need to tailor it to each situation. In other words, there is no uh, universal solution that we can apply to the survey development in all the different situations. You need to tailor it. There's no kitchen recipe for this type of activity. Um, in addition, uh, this uh, guidelines will show you uh, how it is important to uh, uh, design uh, a survey involving multiple competencies. You need to have the involvement of risk managers because of their decisions that will uh, play a, a major role in the resources that you will have for doing the survey. You need to capture the scientific knowledge. You need to know how the spread of the disease is, is, is being uh, uh, done, how the epidemic develops. You need to have a good knowledge of the landscape and of the territory. It is also very important to consider the experience in surveys implementation in your member state for doing this work. So this basically gives you the idea of how many competencies should be involved in the design of a survey. So uh, our, our work uh, started back in 2017 when we received a request from the European Commission to facilitate and support the member states in the planning and execution of the surveys and to provide a practical and concise output addressing the best of the survey work program 2018-2020 and in particular to give uh, guidelines for surveillance for three pilot organisms, amongst which we have Xylella fasciosa, that is the topic of today. And uh, for, for addressing this mandate, we uh, developed a toolkit for pest surveys, where you can clearly see the three different phases of the uh, survey. The first one is survey preparation, that is meant to help to characterize the survey parameters, and uh, that is something that we address in our work, and Elena is going to uh, talk more about that. Then we have the survey design that is uh, mainly uh, 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 where the main focus is to quantify the survey parameters, indicating clearly the assumptions that are related to this quantification, to run statistical tools and calculate sample size. Regarding the survey implementation, the data collection and reporting, they are not addressed in this mandate, but still we provide some indications on how uh, surveys could be concluded uh, based on uh, realized uh, sampling effort. So uh, welcome all to the webinar and uh, you will be uh, uh, guided through the, the, the the guidelines for statistically sound and risk-based surveillance of Zilela fasciosa by Dr. Elena Lazzaro. Uh, she will pr provide a, a, a presentation. She has a Master of Science in Biostatistics and PhD in Statistics and Optimization. Uh, she is currently a researcher at the Valencian Institute for Agricultural Research, IVIA, in Spain. And uh, she's uh, involved in the XF Actors project. And also she is 
uh, uh, participating as an expert in the EFSA working group on pest surveys. And uh, so she has the, all the competencies required uh, and has been working uh, very hard on these guidelines together with the working group. So um, then I would like to uh, indicate how we are going to deal with the questions. So at the end of the, you, you will be able to provide your question throughout the, the, the presentation. But at the end of the presentation, we will provide oral answers to some of the questions as we have limited time. Um, you must know that we are also uh, uh, organizing more webinars that uh, in the course of this year. So we have scheduled two in October and one in December uh, to cover the toolkit for uh, for uh, surveys and uh, the EFSA toolkit for, for surveys. And uh, you will be informed in due time and uh, about uh, when exactly these, uh, these webinars will be held. Um, so I wish you a good uh, webinar and uh, uh, Yes, please don't hesitate to ask your questions. And Elena, now I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sibren, for your nice presentation. Good morning again for everyone. Thank you for your assistance. And welcome to the webinar. And only one more thing, and enjoy it as, as much as possible. So uh, the webinar contents, are structured in three main blocks, don't forget it. Its block corresponds with each of the three steps in which any surveillance activity plan should be organized. The first step consists on the survey preparation. The second step consists on the survey design. And the third step consists on the survey implementation. Yeah. I, what? I know, sorry, sorry. Uh, someone is saying that uh, you can he can't, or she can't hear you. Okay, no, 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 now he can hear you. Sorry, 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 okay, sorry. <laughs> Go on, please. Um, I will explain in more details each one of these steps, but you do not forget them because their consideration is pivotal to plan properly any surveillance activity. Uh, well, survey preparation, as I said before, is the first step to plan a surveillance activity. In this step, the purpose is to define and characterize all survey parameters according to the characteristics of the pest, the characteristics of the territory, that is the survey area, and the aim of the survey. Remember, at the end, we want to know how many host plants we have to inspect and sample to check if the goal of our survey is met. Sample size estimates, that is the, the number of host plants, is going to be dependent on certain assumptions. And these assumptions are defined by means the, the, the survey parameters. Um, for the specific Salida uh, Fastidiosa surveillance activity, a very useful information to prepare the survey is provided in the pest survey card on Salela fastidiosa. Pest survey cards at the end describes the challenges for Salela fastidiosa surveillance and also connects the bacterium epidemiology with the survey parameters characterizations. Uh, this document was published on June uh, 2019 and is available online at the following direction. But as you know, the research process is something dynamic and the latest scientific development about the epidemiology of the Silella, of the Silella fastidiosa will be incorporated in a pest survey card by means of the story map for survey of Silella fastidiosa. In this story map, also the latest legal emersus, uh, emergency measures concerning the pathogen will be integrated. These contents will be published in the next September in the EFSA story map gallery. And you can find this uh, gallery uh, using uh, this link. Uh, as I said before, in the EFSA pest survey card, there are described with a lot of details uh, the most important challenges for Silella fastidiosa surveys. 
to summarize some of them, the more important maybe. Um, there are three main issues we, we cannot forget when we design a Silella fastidiosa survey. The first one is the long asymptomatic period that shows certain host plants. That is uh, the, the tiny prone infection to, express, to expression of symptoms for some host plants is, is very wide. So this is a key challenge of, for our surveys because when we expect and collect samples of a host plant, the expression of symptoms can help the inspector to, to better identify the, the infected parts of the, of the plant. But uh, as you know, in Salela fastidiosa surveys, we cannot forget uh, asymptomatic host plants in which the, the collection of, of samples becomes more, more, more difficult. Uh, the second challenge is the, the wide host range of potential species that could be infected. There are described about 600 species that, that, are, uh, that could be infected by Salera fastidiosa. And in the survey preparation, it's therefore necessary to identify and target species that are more likely to, to be infected. So, guidelines contain a host plant ranking, also not at species level, at genus level according to the probability of being infected by Salela fastidiosa based on the available information for the current outbreak areas in the European Union. So this information can be useful to prioritize and to select the host plants to, to be included in our, in our survey design. And the third challenge is that currently it is not clear how, how to use the vector information in, in the survey design. We have decided not to incorporate in, in the guidelines, in guidelines, the, the use uh, of vector information in the survey design, because the the the, um, the current uncertainty associated to, to the vector status, although all psyllium feeding systems uh, insects are potential vector of Silella fastidiosa, there is a, a high uncertainty on the transmission capability uh, capabilities of, of those uh, insects. Uh, additionally, uh, the sweeping effectiveness in the sweep net sessions sometimes can be very low because it's very, de it's very dependent on the vector abundance in the, the survey area. So in those specific cases in which the density of vector is, is low, inspectors will need to run a lot of sweep net sessions to reach a sufficient sample size of, of vectors. Um, and additionally, furthermore, the traceability of vectors is difficult to, to know. So it's difficult to, to, to link, locate the, the, the disease with the vector uh, location. Um, so this is the most important slide of the webinar. It provides an, overview, an overall overview about the webinar contents. In the first columns, as you can see, there are uh, two key questions um, that we should formulate to decide the type of survey we have to address in our survey area. In the center column, the different survey types um, um, are um, specified according to the specific question that they address. And in the third column, the statistical tools we have available to estimate the number of expansion units to be inspected and tested, and also the survey parameters that we need to quantify and characterize to obtain this estimate of the sample size. So in this presentation, highlight that we only focus on detection survey for press freedom in buffer zones to, to illustrate all the surveillance of the, the survey steps. So method sensitivity is the is a survey parameter, also known as the efficacy of detection in ISP 31, and it could be defined as the probability to detect the pest in an individual inspection unit. It is present. It is the, the, the pest is, is obviously present. It is the combination of the sampling effectiveness and diagnostic sensitivity. And sampling effectiveness, what is sampling effectiveness? Depends on the ability of the inspector to successfully choose the infected parts of, from a host plant. 
And so it's Palu uh, should be fixed according to the training of the inspector. Uh, according with this graph, when the prevalence of visual symptoms is above 12%, as you can see, the prevalence of infection is close to 90%. 90%. Because of that, for Xylella fastidiosa surveys, where we dealt with asymptomatic infections, the sampling effectiveness sometimes will be very low. And diagnostic sensitivity, and that is the, the order factor in, uh, in which method sensitivity depends, can be defin defined as the probability that a sample tests positive when the sample is truly positive. Its value should be um, set according to, to, to the lab method. And here for illustrative purposes, we have considered, we are going to consider a sampling effectiveness about 0.7, about the 70% uh, and, and a diagnosis sensitivity of 78%. So, so thus uh, method sensitivity will be set at 0.55. Well, confidence level and design prevalence are also survey parameters. Um, why is important to consider the statistics for a survey design as an specific, and specifically for a detection survey design? Because it is impossible to say with what with a uh, hundred percent certainty that the best is not present. Imagine this free uh, hypothetical. Uh, survey areas and imagine that, that we inspect and collect the same number of samples for each one of them. Obviously, in the scenario number three, it is more likely to find infection than in the second one, but both of them have in, are infected uh, scenarios. Thus, considering the same sample size for the three scenarios, we can provide, we cannot provide the same conclusions. Um, statistical tools and also confidence and design prevalence value help apps to quantify the uncertainty we are assuming in our survey conclusions and also the level of this of disease that is to say the prevalence level we will accept to live undetected thus carrying out a statistical zone survey design we can say that we, with a given amount of confidence, the prevalence is going to be below a maximum prevalence level. Because of that, in the survey design, we have to set the following survey parameters, confidence level and design prevalence. The confidence level is the amount of confidence we have and the design prevalence, also known as the level of detection in ISP 31, is the maximum prevalence that there um, co could be. Um, I would like to highlight that the, tough, the choice of design prevalence is an issue that, for instance, in the limiting and buffer zone surveys, will affect, will affect the, the eradication success jointly with other factors. We are not going to speak about the eradication, but uh, although I would like to point that um, these graphs highlights the fact and also the importance of the choice of design prevalence. Um, the selection of both values, a confidence level and design prevalence, requires uh, finding a compromise between available resources and the level of risk that the risk managers are willing to, to accept. Uh, another survey parameter that needs to be characterized, characterized and quantified in the survey design are related with the target population. Population uh, can be defined or should be defined in terms of its structure and in terms of its size. For this purpose, we have to identify and quantify currently the inspection units. The inspection units are the host plants. And our final aim is to estimate the number of inspection units to be inspected and sampled to check the survey wall. For example, the best freedom of a survey area. 
Uh, another uh, relevant um, concept in the definition of the target population is, uh, uh, is related with the epidem epidemiological units. The epidemiological units, uh, within an epi unit, we aggregate those inspections units which share the same epidemiological risk. That is, each epidemiological unit is homogeneous in terms of epidemiological risk. The size of the epi units influence at the end the estimates of the sample size. And the risk factors, it is another survey parameter that is linked to the structure and size of the target population. Um, but uh, risk factors could be considered in a survey design uh, optionally. Their consideration allows us to enforce the survey efforts in those areas in which um, where the probabilities of, of finding the pest is are highest, but and obviously a risk factors influence sample size estimates. To be included in a survey design, uh, each risk factor should be characterized as a minimum with two levels, and what of them should be quantified by its relative risks and the proportion of the target population in which each one of these levels applies. So, to better characterize the target population, structure, and size, it could be recommendable to structure it in different hierarchical levels, as it is so in the image. That is, host plants in the survey area, host plant according to, to different land use categories. For Silella fastidiosa, we propose um, our proposal is to consider agricultural areas, forest areas, urban areas, and all and semi wild areas. Host plants uh, within the epidemiological units, risk factors in each epi unit, and inspection units. The characterization and quantification of the target population parameters depends on the state of the, on the, of the knowledge in the, in the survey area. Um, remember, all the survey parameters, as, as I have explained before, confidence level, design prevalence, method sensitivity, population size, risk factors, influence at the end the sample size estimates. So the number of inspection units to be sampling, and, um, and obviously there are there, there, these parameters are interrelated. Here we provide two graphs. In the first one, at it can observe it for a given confidence level, the sample size estimated decreases as the method sensitivity increases. In other words, for a given sample size, the achieved confidence level increases as the method sensitivity uh, increases. In the second graph, as it can be observed, for a given design prevalence, the sample size increases as the method sensitivity uh, decreases. In other words, for a given sample size, the design prevalence increases as the method sensitivity decreases. In general terms, the lower the design prevalence and the higher the confidence level, the stronger the evidence for pest freedom. So you don't forget this message. Uh, River is a, uh, an online free application in which methodology behind statistical zones and risk by surveys uh, is implemented to obtain an estimate of the sample size. After a simple registration process, you can access it. This is the link that uh, you can use in order to access the application. In Rives, introducing the survey parameters information, an estimation of the sample size is provided. Note that uh, I, I would like to, to highlight that the statistical principles behind the tool are in line with the methodology that supports ISPM 31. And Rives is usually used in surveillance activities in animal health, and it will be adapted to plant health specifically in an ex future. Well, we will go to the second step, um, the survey designs. That is, once survey preparation has finished, 
the next step is the, uh, in the planning of the survey is the survey design. In this step, it is necessary to quantify each survey parameter indicating the related assumptions as inputs of the statistical tools, for our case, Rivers tool, to obtain an estimation of the number of inspection units to be inspected and sampled for, for, for testing and testing. So EFSA guidelines for surveys of Xylella fastidiosa is the reference document to, to, to get the surveyor in the step of the, the survey design. This is a large and a wide document in which different survey designs are simulated by means of several illustrative examples. Uh, this document has just been published and is um, also available online in the, at the following link. This webinar blog only highlights some aspects of the survey design. So my our recommendation is to read the, to read the, the whole document to have a more comprehensive a, a more comprehensive a more comprehensive uh, vision of the of the survey of design. Also, the survey design step uh, can be organized in three sub uh, sub steps. Firstly, we need to set the values of the survey parameters based on the characteristics of the bacterium, the characteristics of the survey area, the aim of the survey, and the, the, the resources availability. It's important to make a balance between uh, the resources availability and the risk we are willing to accept when we set survey parameters. The second... Uh, secondly, uh, once the parameters are quantified, um, we introduce, sorry, because secondly, once the parameters are quantified, we introduce them in, in RIVES to obtain an estimation of the sample size. Remember that uh, we are using the term sample size uh, uh, with the aim to refer to the number of inspection units to be inspected and sampled for lab testing. And thirdly, the, the final step is to allocate the number of host plants to be sampled in the survey area. So the first step is to quantify survey parameters. Remember the survey parameters are in total five, confidence level, design prevalence, population size, and risk factor, and also method sensitivity. Although if we don't have enough information to exploit risk factors, it is also possible to estimate the sample size without considering it. So remember the, the, this point. And the second step in the survey design is to estimate the number of host plants to sample, that is the sample size. This is the reverse screenshot. You can see is the place in which, the, in which we must introduce the survey parameters, that is confidence level, population size, method sensitivity, the size prevalence, the functionality we have to choose to estimate sample size and the output with the estimation of the number of inspection units to be sampled um, and tested. Um, the third step, if you remember, is to allocate the sample size in the survey area. We will illustrate it afterwards using an, an illustrative example. So, considering an illustrative situation, simple and not real, now we provide an example of a, a survey design for carrying out a pest freedom survey for a buffer uh, zone. Our fictitious buffer zone uh, is within a demarcated area in which a unique infested zone is delimited. Buffer zone covers an extension of 10 kilometers around with uh, the infested zone, that is uh, approximately uh, 48,000 uh, hectares. In the buffer zone, we can distinguish free land use categories, agricultural land areas in green, uh, urban areas in purple, and non-cultivated areas uh, in white. But obviously, only in the first two, there is in the agricultural areas and urban areas, uh, there is a presence of host plants. So for our survey design, we are going to consider that the whole 
urban areas as a single epidemiological unit and also all agri areas as a single epidemiological unit. And according to the characteristics of our buffer zone and the bacterium characteristics, the arm of the survey, uh, and the risk that we are willing to accept, uh, we have set the survey parameters for each one of these land use categories uh, considering these values. This table shows all the information we have to collect in the survey uh, preparation and we need this information to estimate the sample size. Not that for agri areas, we will consider a risk factor based on the proximity of the infested zone. The outer band of uh, 400 meters surrounding the infested zone is considered to have, to have higher risk at past time, okay, exactly, than the rest of the buffer zone. To illustrate the estimate of sample size in previous, we, we will only show the simulation of agri areas, and not that it's important to highlight this point, the survey parameters values do not follow the current, le the current legislation's um, values. Values here are used only for illustrative purpose. Okay, you don't forget it. And we are going to show how to run the simulations in riders. So, in RIVES, the first step is to introduce the survey parameters and to select the RIVES functionality. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the RIVES functionality is sample site. Here we introduce confidence level, here population size, here method sensitivity, and here design prevalence. The second step is to introduce uh, risk factors. Remember that we are going to run the simulation for the agri areas in which we have considered a risk factor based on the proximity of the infected of the infected uh, of the infect, of the infested zone. For this specific case, the risk factor has two levels: high risk that correspond to the band of uh, 400 meters surrounding the infested zone and the, um, the Vaseline one that does correspond to the rest buffer zone. Its risk factor is characterized by its relative risks, by a two and one, and its proportion within the population. Okay, uh, this value can be obtained at the ratio between the number of host plants in the agri, um, in the high risk area, by the number, the total number of host plants in the agri area. So, Additionally, for this illustrative purpose, we are using the functionality of convenient samples. So, in which we set uh, our decision to sample twice more times in hash risk areas than in baseline areas. Finally, after the submitting process in Rivers, um, um, the program provides us the estimates of sample size that is the number of inspection units to be inspected and, and sampled for laboratory testing for each one of the risk areas. So this table summarizes for the specific agricultural areas in the OWA buffer zone surveys, the sample size estimates for the different risk areas of the agri area. To finalize the survey design step, we have to allocate these samples in the agri area. There are a lot of possibilities to, to allocate the samples. Here, we propose, only for illustrative purpose, one possibility is to allocate them proportionally to the extent of one of the areas, which means that we have to inspect and sample seven uh, inspection units per hectare in the high risk. Uh, areas and um, sample uh, for the baseline risk level areas uh, to take one sample it's for each uh, 18 hectares. For the urban areas we will proceed in the same way to estimate the sample size but we can we are going not so the, the, the simulations. And then to finish we go to the the third step, the survey implementation, 
Now, once the sample size has been estimated, and assuming we have gone to the buffer zone, inspected and collected the samples, uh, how we can interpret the information obtained after the survey implementation? How can we conclude our survey? It's important to remark than that, as Sirian said before, data collection and reported is not addressed in the guidelines and obviously in the webinar, but we provide some indications on survey conclusion. And that's the issue we will address in the following slides. Remember the, the buffer zone survey that I have explained it before. This table provides a summary of the sample size estimated for the whole buffer zone afterwards running simulation in rivers. Uh, also for the agricultural agri areas land use types and also for the urban areas land use types. And this is the total sample size that we have to inspect and collect for the whole buffer zone area. To conclude about the whole buffer zone area, it is necessary to consider it to consider a unique design prevalence and to estimate an overall confidence level for the whole survey area. For this pur purpose, we have to re-estimate the achieved confidence level for urban areas, for this specific illustrative example, under a design prevalence of 0.04%. The equivalence between a design prevalence of 0.1 and a confidence level of 78 is uh, this equivalence of a design prevalence of 0.04% and a confidence level of 45%. And this graph shows these equivalent values. So um, we have a unique design prevalence for each land use categories and the active confidence level for each, for each one of the land use categories. So um, we have the possibility to build a unique survey, uh, a survey conclusion for the whole survey area under a design, a unique design prevalence. So we can estimate the overall confidence level using the following formula, taking into consideration the achieved confidence level for its land use type areas. So uh, the conclusion of our survey can be assuming that in the buffer zone, the epidemiology of Salela fastidiosa is similar in all agricultural areas and in all urban areas. After implementing the buffer zone survey, Sula, Sula the, the, the whole sample test negative, it could be concluded that with an overall 87.99% um, confidence for the whole super, whole the four buffer zone, if Savilela fastidiosa is present, the number of infected plants is below our design prevalence value, that is 0.04%. Under the population estimated for the whole buffer zone, zone, it means that the number of host plant inspected are, uh, are between 0 and 3,500 approximately. And we have assumed below this maximum number of infected plants or a buffer zone are, uh, can be considered free for Silella fastidiosa infection. But now, imagine that the reality when we perform the inspection does not allow the inspector to inspect the estimated sample uh, size for various reasons. So we cannot provide the same conclusion as before. Imagine in the highest uh, risk area of the agri area, we have expected not uh, 2,700 uh, 2, sample, and we have expected 4,000 samples. And in, the bas and, the, and in the baseline area, we have expected 1,000 uh, samples. On the other hand, um, in the urban area, it has only been possible to inspect and sample 100 host plants. Following the same procedure as explained before, we need to re-estimate the achieved confidence level for each one of the land use category under a unique design prevalence in order to provide a um, uh, overall confidence level for the whole buffer zone area and to, and to 
to draw the, the conclusion of our survey. So Rives has a functionality to estimate the achieved confidence level, and we are going to show how to, to proceed. Uh, for the agri-areas, the first step consists, so OIM is like to estimate the achieved confidence level under the, this number of samples. So remember it. So we can use, uh, we can estimate this value using also reviews, but changing the functionality, okay? The functionality that we have to choose for this purpose is name, global, and group sensitivity. So the first step consists on select, obviously, the reverse functionality for this specific purpose and introduce survey parameters, that is um, population size, method sensitivity, and design, uh, <clears throat> and design prevalence. The second step for the specific case of the agri areas in which we have managed the use of risk factors in sample size estimates we need to introduce information about the risk factors. Uh, its risk factor level must be characterized, but its relative risk and the, and the portion of the population where it's one of the levels applies. We must also introduce the true number of inspection units we have inspected and tested, okay? And as you can see, this corresponds with, with this number of samples. Um, after the submitting process, uh, Rives provide us the overall, the, the achieved confidence level for the whole agri areas in the buffer zone. Okay, we will proceed in the same manner with the, the, the urban areas. Uh, we have to choose the Rives functionality and introduce survey parameters related to this uh, land type uh, survey area. And for this specific case, we don't have into, we didn't have to consider uh, risk factors. So we, in this step, we have to introduce the, the number of host plants that we have collected and inspected for, for urban areas. And then after the submitting process, we can uh, uh, reverse provide us the, the achieved confidence level about 2% for this specific case in, this, uh, in the urban areas. So, This uh, table summarizes all the information we need to conclude about the survey. That is, with the active confidence level for each one loose category, we can use, using the same formula that I have explained in the slides before, the overall confidence level for the whole survey area. So, assuming the same condition of homogeneity that, uh, that we have explained before, after implementing the buffer zone survey, so all the, the, the samples test negative, it could be concluded that with an overall uh, confidence above 86.28% uh, uh, confidence for the whole buffer zone, if silella fastidiosa is present, the number of infected plants is below 0.04%. Uh, Under the population estimated for the whole buffer zone, it means that the number of host plants infected are between zero and approximately 3,500 uh, host plants. This is the acceptability of the risk we have assumed considering a design prevalence of 0.04%. And obviously, the achieved confidence levels reflects the accuracy of our conclusion. Although we have provided an overall conclusion for the whole survey area, and the level of confidence reached is about uh, 86%, we cannot forget with this uh, sample size for the urban area, the achieved confidence level, the accuracy of uh, the surveys in the urban area is only 2%. Um, that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Just to let me show all the members, all the members of the working group which are supporting this webinar from a less visible part. And we also uh, want to thank all member states, national and regional plant protection organizations for their truthful comments and suggestions 
in the development of the per survey car and the guidelines for survey. It's time to questions. Let us one minute to organize them. Um, as Cypriot mentioned before, we have time to answer orally about 15 minutes. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for Elena, for your interesting speech. Uh, as, as Elena said, we are organizing your, uh, your questions. So Zivren and uh, Elena will answer them in this final part of the webinar. I would like to thank you, all of you, the, for your strong participation and your strong interaction. Yeah interesting uh, questions. I would like to thank uh, ESCOM, Sustainable Communication, that is uh, the partner uh, of the X-Factor project who is managing the communication, the webinars and the whole communication of the uh, X-Factor project. I forget to uh, mention it at the beginning of the, of the webinar. So thank you for and again for your speech, Zibren, now you can, I can see you again, you can answer and you can uh, speak when you want. Of course, we can wait um, some, uh, a few minutes so we can organize the, the questions that are, that we collected, we have been collected during, the, during the Elena's uh, presentation. And there are various questions that Simon and Elena will answer them very, very soon. So maybe I could start, in fact, uh, already with the first question, so we gain some time. Uh, so first of all, thanks, Massimiliano, and thanks a lot, uh, Elena, for this very clear presentation. And thanks for the interest to this webinar. I see there's a lot of people attending. And uh, so what I will do, I will go through the questions that we received, uh, that uh, not all the questions, because I think in the time frame we will not be able to address them all. Um, so the first uh, question that we will address is uh, uh, regarding survey preparation. Uh, so from uh, Malika Bonfour. Um, and uh, Malika Bonfour asks, for intraspecific variation, are you referring to the insect or the disease? In fact, we mean intraspecific variation for the pathogen, uh, for the different uh, sequence uh, types of Xylella fastidiosa, we observe uh, different host ranges. And of course, this will affect the plant species that we will include in the survey. Then uh, another question from Stephen White. Uh, it is about uh, uh, how do you quantify the inspector effectiveness? Uh, thanks for that question. And uh, in these uh, specific uh, uh, guidelines, the inspector sampling effectiveness was estimated at 0.7, so 70%, to run the rebus calculations. Of course, the inspector effectiveness is uh, 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 varying a lot, depending not only on the training of the inspector, but uh, also if the inspector knows already the disease or has been exposed in areas or has been uh, uh, close to infected zone, has been able to, to see how the epidemics develops in an area. But it also depends even on the the time of the day that samples will be taken. It will also depend on how the uh, NPPO procedure defines the samples to be taken on the, uh, on the inspection unit. So how the leaves are taken from the four cardinal points of an olive tree and at three different levels of the height of the tree. So this, this type of, of, of uh, uh, elements will give a clear uh, uh, variation in the and in the sampling effectiveness. So it is impossible for us to provide a, a clear value on that. It needs to be estimated uh, at the level of the uh, area to survey. Um, um, <clears throat> Elena, um, you? Yes, um, not nothing to add, Sibling, continue, sorry me. 
just just to say yes, I, I read now in the in the chat uh, Stephen that Stephen White uh, wrote uh, but uh, they could be asymptomatic which would uh, affect the seventy percent. He added this after you answer him. Yes, yeah, so if you take the, the, the leaves from four cardinal points of the tree at three different levels of the tree, you have more chances to, to take an, uh, uh, if, if the tree is asymptomatically infected, you have more chances to take an infected leaf than if you just take uh, 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 some leaves of one branch. So this means that there is a high variation on, 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 the, on the effectiveness of sampling depending on the procedure that you will apply for the sampling. So and it is it is one of the key challenges to uh, uh, reduce the, uh, the, the uncertainty about the sampling effectiveness as much as possible as this is one of the key drivers of the method sensitivity. But Elena, you wanted to add on this answer. No, no, nothing to add. Only just to 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 agree with you totally. Yes, probably a value of zero point seventy is a very high value. It's going to be dependent of yes. Yes, so we took a value of 07 in our work. We discussed it quite a lot uh, because we cover a very wide uh, uh, range of, uh, of hosts. So for some hosts, we can take the entire plant as a sample. For other hosts, we can just take some leaves. So uh, on average, we, we consider that 070 would be uh, maybe uh, quite a realistic uh, value. So uh, this is something that can be adjusted depending on how, how on, on the hosts that are going to be taken on the situations and the procedures uh, uh, that are applied for the, for the inspection in the field and the sampling. There is a next question. Do you want to address that, Elena, uh, from Stephen White and Francoise Peter, that asks if uh, do you need to distinguish between different hosts, or are they all treated equally? So yes, uh, different plan. As you know, different plant species may have different diagnostic sensitivity in the lab, and this should be taken into account in order just to, to provide a, an overall, no? An overall um, diagnostic sensitivity, no? Uh, so we can estimate an overall value considering all the host plants that you are uh, included in your survey, no? Yes. So, and this is the way because for polyga lab, the lab, sens the lab sensitivity methods are very high, um, and in other, in, in other cases, for another species, the lab sensitivity, uh, the diagnostic sensitivity is, is lower. So if you are going to consider different host plants in your survey design, you can provide an overall uh, diagnostic sensitivity. Probably okay. using the, I don't know, using the mean or something like that, or, or balance it according to the number of if you have the quantification, obviously, of the different host uh, plants in your survey area to provide um, an average uh, value according to the representativeness of, 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 the, of these host plants. Yes. No? So, Sibren? Yes. So I think it's very important to, to go to the diagnostic protocols that are existing and that are prepared by uh, uh, the European uh, and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, so EPO. They have a, a, a good uh, recap of all the methods that are used or uh, that are accepted for the uh, laboratory uh, diagnostics. And these values have to be multiplied by the uh, sampling effectiveness to have a clear idea of the method sensitivity. So the method sensitivity has two, th those two components, the sampling effectiveness and the diagnostic sensitivity that is much closer to one, the diagnostic sensitivity. So it influences much less the overall method sensitivity. So effort should be done on the determination of the sampling effectiveness. So maybe we can jump to the next question if if uh, possible. Um, so on the survey design, we received a question from Graeme Cross. 
uh, that asks that when the Ribes tool has proposed required sample numbers, would you recommend a purely random sampling method within the area or focus attention on, for example, particular host plant groups? And I think, uh, Elena, you can give a good answer to this question. Um, that's something that can be done to consider uh, the results of the modeling, which the relative risk for different host plants have been estimated and to use that information to maximize the probability of finding or infested hosts. In principle, a random sample scheme of the area, uh, it could be a, a, a good approach to take the samples, but considering that the risk of host groups is different, that will uh, uh, ensure the identification of infested hosts in the area, which is the main purpose of the, the surveillance. So probably uh, when, when you perform, a, when in the survey design, you are going to select the, the more representative host plants that are susceptible to cellular fastidiosa infection. Um, probably a random sample, as I said before, it could be a, a good uh, approach to to, to, to select the inspection units, but if you manage also information about uh, relative risk of different host plants, that information can be used like to better uh, select the, the, the infection, the, the inspection units. Okay. Thank you, uh, Elena. Then um, we received a question from Ana Maria Castrignano. Uh, that ask uh, how to select uh, the plants for survey in terms of uh, uh, locations. I think we did uh, quite a, a work in our guideline document, so there is a lot of information available in the guideline document. And maybe, Elena, you could address this question? Yes. Um, depending on this, uh, how to select the plants for survey, so for survey uh, I think that is fundamental. If, uh, the better as you know your territory, uh, the better you are going to select the host plants. But in the guidelines, we provide uh, some useful information. We provide a host, uh, um, um, host plants rank um, table in which the main import or the more representative uh, um, genus of host plants can, uh, are organized according to the probability of to be infected by, based on the information available of the current um, outbreaks in the European Union. So it could be possible to select, the, to prioritize your, the plants that, the, that you have to inspect using this information that uh, probably will be, uh, it need to be updated. And also in the correct meat, uh, Sibrinify and growth, in the pest survey card, there are different strategies um, how to, to select the host plants. For instance, it could be a, a recommendable to select those host plants that, are, that uh, can be infected for more than one Silella fastidiosa subspecies or something like that. So also yes. in the pest to bake car and also in the grid lines, you, uh, do, both documents contain information at that, reha, at that regard to select uh, how to, to select the, the host plants. Yes, I confirm, uh, Elena. So in the pest survey card, we provide a series of reasonings that can help you in the choice of the uh, uh, the, the host plants for your survey. So, um, and and there are some uh, arguments such as uh, the, the the those hosts are uh, specifically uh, affected in different uh, phytosanitary crises in the world, or. Uh, uh, these host plants are uh, also uh, very much uh, uh, overlapping with the host range of the vectors. And there is a series of, of, of different arguments that you could consider for uh, selecting the host in your area. It is impossible to tell you which are the hosts you should use in your area uh, 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 sitting from where we are. What is uh, what we can do is provide you the argument, uh, the arguments you should consider to select yourself 
to hosts. And then there is the work that was done, the, the data that were analyzed to help you also uh, uh, in the selection of the host uh, uh, that is uh, uh, provided in the guideline document. Um, then we received also an answer from a, a question from Malika Bonfour um, that asked, I'm still not clear how you decide the host plant to survey and to sample. And this was just explained. Uh, I think we can uh, go to the next question. Uh, what do you think, Elena? Uh, just um, which one from? From Malika Bonfour that is asking yes. that she's saying that she's still not clear how to decide the host oh. plants to survey and to sample. So that one we have just clarified. Yes go to the next one, no, Sibren? Yes. So we received a question from Teresa Afonso that asked that after setting the sample size, can we use composite samples? Um, you want to answer, Elena? I, I don't know if I... I, I either the, 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 because this is something that is not um, just like something that well in fact then I, I, I take I take I take it then so the, there is a, a question from Teresa Afonso that asks after setting sample size can we use composite samples and uh, um, we will address it together with a question from Vincente Dalmao Sorli um, that asks in order to reduce the number of analysis in a buffer zone where the presence of disease disease is not known to occur, is it possible to analyze samples from the same inspection unit as a single composite sample? Which limits risks have the composite sample? So, uh, yes, it is possible to use uh, composite samples as uh, this is uh, uh, incorporated when establishing the method sensitivity. And there are uh, two potential approaches to collecting such composite samples either by pooling in the field or pooling in the laboratory. When uh, pooling is done in the laboratory, branches from uh, multiple trees will be collected in the field and the number of leaves per branch will then be taken from multiple branches and combi combined into a single sample. The number of leaves per sample depends then on the weight of the leaves. When the pooling is done in the field, the composite sample will be produced on site, again by taking a number of leaves from branches of multiple trees. The disadvantage of this procedure is that it, it, it's not possible to retest a new sample without revisiting the field. And this would be relevant in the case of a positive detection and when it is possible to determine which tree was positive from the remaining leaves or the stored branches in the laboratory. Um, examples of all these recommendations for composite sampling are, 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 are very well uh, provided and given in the EPO uh, standard, PM724. I will go to the following question from Yol uh, Yolanda Persolja. Um, how to estimate, uh, calculate the number of host plants in urban areas? for example, for private gardens or public greens. Thank you. Well, um, the, the exact size will often not be known, and it will then be needed to make a reliable estimate on the number of host plants in urban areas based on the available information in the survey area. When this is not possible uh, to, to, to quantify the size of the of the, the number of inspection units you, you, you have, for instance, for this specific case in the urban area, it does not matter that much because uh, under a certain population size, the host population can be considered as infinite from an, an statistical point of view. And also you can obtain an estimation of the sample size without not introducing this information. I would like to highlight that it's better when you can, you, you, you should uh, quantify the number of inspection units, uh, using a, making a reliable estimate of that. But if not, you can also uh, run uh, simulations where, without specifying the sample size estimation because there is a 
statistical rationing behind that, you can find this rationing in the guidelines, approximately about the page number 14, in which it is possible <coughs> uh, to, 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 to obtain an estimation of the sample size. So my message is, uh, it's better to, uh, to quantify the number of, of inspection units you have. But if it is not possible, because the accessibility to, for private gardens or public grids is not possible and you don't have a certain idea of, of how the, the, the host plants are distributed in your sub-bay area, it's also possible to estimate a sample size, assuming an infinite populate condition from a statistical point of view. Of you. And you can also find this information and this reasoning in the in the guidelines about page 14. Sibren, if you want to add something at that regard. No, no, it's okay. It's clear. Um, uh, we receive also a question from Eduardo Perez Laorga. Uh, who is saying that it is, uh, he thinks that it is a very difficult methodology to apply in forest lands with a mixture of susceptible shrub, uh, scrub uh, species and a number of individuals that is very difficult to calculate. Yes, uh, it is true that it is difficult to estimate the target population in a forest uh, environment, but uh, as you ha might have seen on the on, on the in, in the guideline documents or in the, 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 the screenshots that were shown by Elena in the presentation, um, uh, what happens is that uh, we can assume an infinite population. If we assume an infinite population, uh, uh, the population, the increase of the population will not have an effect on the sample size, meaning that uh, in those in that situation uh, there will uh, it will be uh, we we don't have a problem in estimating target population, but still there will be a challenge in allocating the sample size to the different survey locations. And in particular, uh, if, if we are dealing with a, a very heterogeneous environment. So then the allocation will have to be proportional to the, to the surface, for example. And I think, uh, Massimiliano, uh, uh, we have uh, reached somehow the end of the, of the question and answer uh, uh, session. And I would really like to thank the, the, the people that have uh, asked the questions uh, uh, for their interest in this, in this topic and uh, for, for uh, needing more clarifications. There will be more opportunities to provide you, uh, again, explanations. There will be more webinars. There will be more uh, uh, sessions in, in training sessions also organized on the side of EFSA. And uh, also thanks a lot, uh, Elena, for your very clear presentation. And thanks to all the people that are behind the scene also helping us in screening and organizing all the questions and the answers. Uh, uh, so thanks a lot for this interest. And uh, Massimiliano, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Zibren. Yes, it's been a very interesting webinar a very strong participation, very good discussion in the chat too. We can export the history chat. So if someone, if um, any one of you want to <coughs> uh, uh, read again the question, the answer, there has been a lot of uh, answer and question inside the, the, the chat too. And uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Zibren and Elena for their very interesting contribution for their avail avail availability and um, i would like to thank of course as i said before uh, ESCOM, uh, sustainable communication the partners of the xf actors project who is managing the web communication the, the webinars too and um, thank for your strong interest. the 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 webinar is um, it's been recorded, so you can uh, check uh, it on our website in the next days and on, on, on our YouTube channel where you can find also, in case you miss them, also the, the other webinar. This, is, this was the sixth webinar, as we said. Thank you again for your speech and your contribution, and um, thank you. We see. 
see you next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.